Well, I hope you're hungry because today we're going to teach you how to eat well. And a little bit later in the show, we're going to teach you how to work off some of those pounds. With me is uh, Ivy Stark, who is the executive chef over at Dos Caminos. Yes. How's the accent? Dos Caminos. Perfect. Which means uh, two roads. Two roads, yes. Which, which, uh, which means what? Right. Well, um, our original location is on Park Avenue in New York, which mm -hmm. has two directions. Um, it also sort of refers to the fact that um, we do authentic food, but with a contemporary twist. So two ways. It also means two ways. So. Two way yes, and uh, and one of those ways is over at the Palazzo Hotel. <laughs> exactly. Right where you have a restaurant. Yes, we do. And. Um, now, you look to me like you should be somebody, you know, skiing down a slope from Colorado. <laughs> well, I grew you know, up in Colorado, <laughs> yeah. so I do that as often as I possibly can. So um, you're right. <laughs> right. So, but, but, you know, how does a, a gal from Colorado, Colorado end up being, you know, writing a book, a cookbook mm -hmm. on Mexican food? Yes. Well, um, having grown up in Colorado, my family took all of our vacations there. So it was close to Mexico. We were going to Mazatlan when I was five years old. And... I ate my first uh, jalapeno on a Mexicana flight to Mexico. My parents were very adventurous eaters, so they were taking us out to eat all the time. My father's in the hotel business, and I grew up around it. So, And I just fell in love with it and couldn't think of anything I wanted to do more than cook. Now, most of us think, when we talk here, the term Mexican food, yes. well, I'm going to go get a taco or go to mm -hmm. Chipotle or you know, Taco Bell or that type of thing. Right. But it's it's really much broader than that, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. It's um, We've just scratched the surface in the United States of, like, what Mexican food is. Um, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, you know, fortunately, people are becoming more interested in it, and so um, we're able to teach people more and show people more. But um, a lot of people don't realize that Mexico is surrounded by coastline, and there's a lot of wonderful seafood there. Um, there's not a lot of the melted, cheesy, gooey stuff that you see here, um, maybe in the northern part in the border, but you really won't see melted cheese almost anywhere else. So, how, how is it that we do that in America? Like, we take um Oh, uh, Chinese food. Yes. And whatever they, they serve in Chinese restaurants, there's yes. nowhere to be found in China. Absolutely now, not. In, in the pizza, yes. you know, in the United States is so different than, than what's going on in Italy. And, right. and with the Mexican food, you know, you, know, you think of the cheeses and mm -hmm. um, tacos and uh, that type of and that's not really what's going on in, in the homeland. No, not at all. It's, and it's the same story. It's just an American interpretation. And, you know, I think more and more restaurants are trying to do a more authentic version. So you'll see a lot more authenticity where you're seeing it like in Italian food now. You can There are places where you can get a pizza like you can get in Rome. Um, you can get um, Peking duck like you can get in Beijing. Um, so our goal is to also give you Mexican food as it's cooked in Mexico. And I noticed that in some of the recipes in yes. your book, that some of them are really quite healthy. Because yes. you know, one of my pet peeves is when I go to Mexico, like, mm -hmm. I, I can't find a piece of broccoli or mm -hmm. uh, an asparagus. I mean, you know, it, they're traditional things of what I view as you know, healthy vegetables you know, right. just don't seem to be on the menus in Mexico. Well, there are a lot of vegetables. Um, people are surprised when you find them. Um, it's possible that maybe they're not offered in the restaurants where you've been, but certainly on the street, you can get a beautiful street salad like this. This is um, you know, our version of the street salad, but what you would get is a cup of you know, cucumber spears, mango, fresh mango, jicama, pineapple, all good fresh fruit with a little squeeze of lime and chili, very healthy. And also I have a, a grilled cactus salad, which is also very popular. No, okay, when you say grilled cactus yes. salad, I mean, we have, look, this is Las Vegas, you know, yes. we have lots of cactus. Yes. I never thought about eating them though. Yes, they are quite delicious. They sort of have the texture and flavor of green beans. Um, very healthy, they're really high in fiber, and um, which is, you know, very good to, for weight loss. You know, you wanna keep full all the time. Um, but uh, it's typically just tossed with a little bit of vinegar and oil and grilled and some onions and tomatoes. There's nothing healthier than that. And where do you, where do you find uh, what is cacti? <laughs> <laughs> we buy it. I mean, they grow it for us. Um, it's probably shipped from Texas for us, but... Uh -huh. um, no, is it not readily available in... In, in uh, New York City. In Albertson's uh, <laughs> supermarket? Probably yeah. out here, yeah, yeah. You can probably find it pretty easily. When I go visit my father in Colorado, uh, it, it's in the grocery stores there. 
Now, we're not encouraging people to go out and start uh, eating cactus, right? Sure, why not? Oh, oh, really? Try it. Is the there... recipe's in there. I actually talk about how to handle cactus in there and how to how to clean a cactus. And oh, really? Yeah. How to avoid uh, injury as, <laughs> yeah, you, as you're yes, eating, right? Yes. Because you want to make sure that's all clean. You don't want to have to digest one of those uh, yeah, exactly. needles, no, right? Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to make something for us? Uh, well, today? I was going to make um, guacamole, which is one of our signatures mm -hmm. at Dos Caminos, which mm -hmm. is also a very healthy dish. Healthy. Everybody likes guacamole. Yes, and yeah. everybody loves it, so um, I'm going to make it for you. Okay. So, um, it's very easy to make as well. Um, start out with a nice um, ripe Hass avocado. How do you know what, when you're choosing an avocado, what is the best way to choose it? I will tell you. Um, it's You want to look for a dark, sort of pebbly, shiny skin. Okay. You don't want to look see any dry striations on it. If that's the case, it means it's old. Um, you want to press it gently, and if it just yields to your pressure, that means it's ripe. Uh -huh. You see how that yeah, yeah, works? Yeah. You also want to make sure the stem is intact. Um, if the stem is removed, it means air can get in there and oxidize oh, and turn the avocado brown. That's a great tip. Yes, okay. it is. That's one of the most important ones. A lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, if you couldn't find a ripe avocado, a quick way to ripen them is to put it in a paper bag with an apple, which releases a natural gas that will ripen it faster. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you do that with peaches and some other fruits as Absolutely well, Absolutely right? same yeah. thing, yeah. And, and why a paper bag instead of, like, a plastic? I think because it can breathe a little bit. You don't want the mm -hmm. um, the uh, the um, condensation. Okay. Yeah. All right. So all right. So we, now we found the right avocado. Okay. We have the right right avocado, and like I said, now you want the stem intact. The first thing you do is take away the stem and get it as far away from the bowl that you're making the guacamole as possible. Don't want to eat the stem. No, because it yeah. inevitably will end up cracking your tooth unless oh, you okay. remove it. So. Um, and then we're going to open our avocado, and the safest way to do that is to um, put it in a towel in your hand, and you take the knife, and you go sort of lengthwise here and go around, and you're just protecting your hand the whole time. Split the two halves. Got a little bit of brown, but that's okay. A little bit of brown is just a little bit of extra sugar. And we just gently nick the seed with the knife, and remove it, always watching your hand, and then we just take that away. Now, can you grow avocado uh, plants out of the seed, with the seed? Yes, you can, absolutely. You just put a little toothpick in there, put it in a glass with water and some sunshine, and then it will grow an avocado How plant. How about that? Yep. Um, then we're going to score the avocado, which means we're just going to take some, make it like a checkerboard pattern in okay. there. Do that for both of these. I've already cut myself twice. No, <laughs> if I would have been doing this, uh, you have watching, to, you know, watching the, you. The sharper, yeah. the sharper the knife, the less likely you are to cut yourself because it's not going to slip on the food and slip oh, off onto okay. your hand. So keep your knife sharp. So I'm going to. Oh, I'm skipping a step. So I've got my avocado ready, and I'm going to take a little bit of salt in my molcajete, which is a traditional Mexican mortar. Um, we this is made out of resin. Um, you also see the lava stone. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the salt is is not your typical this table. Is, this is, is a, a thicker. Uh, this is kosher salt. salt. Kosher, okay. So use kosher, kosher. or sea salt. Right. Yeah, table salt is not so delicious in my opinion. We never use it. Um, a little bit. Uh, this is a mixture of jalapeno and serrano chilies. Jalapenos are a little more fruity. Serrano are a little more spicy. So mm -hmm. we add the serranos for spice. I'm gonna add a little bit of onion and a little bit of cilantro. I'm also going to take this fancy lime squeezer, which is my favorite part of doing this whole thing, is just squeezing the lime, because these are fun. You don't have to have one of these. You could just you know, use your hand or a fork, squeeze some lime juice into there. We squeeze all of our lime juices. You get a lot of juice out of yeah. that lime. Yeah. You get more when you have that sort of squeezing power. I'm the most important part of making the guacamole is making the paste. I'm going to add a little bit more onion. You want to um, sort of crush the onion and the chili together so it releases all the oil. Okay. So that's the most important step and the key to good guacamole because then all that flavor will be released into the avocado and it'll be nice and super delicious. Okay, let's go. I'm going to scoop the avocado right into that bowl. Oh, and it comes apart so nicely for you. Yes. You know, the, it's like 
the skin is almost a, a work of art. I have a lot, a lot yeah. of practice at making this. You could yeah. do this though easily. It's not that hard. I'm going to take this. This is this is actually a Japanese rice spoon, but we find it works really well for mixing our guacamole. I'm just going to crush it up a little bit mm -hmm. and toss it. We like our guacamole chunky at Dos Caminos. If you prefer it more smashed, smash it more. If you like it chunky, leave it chunky. But the perfect texture for me is just a little bit of chunks and just enough creaminess to sort of hold it all together. So I think I've got that right about now. And then I'm going to add back just a touch more onion just for texture. So you get the crunch from the onion because we smashed all of that up before. A little more cilantro for the same reason. I'm going to add a little more chili because I like mine spicy. How do you like yours? Um, I like it spicy. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you're going to do this, you do it right. Do it right. I agree. And then I'm going to add some tomatoes. And we add those last because we don't want to smash those up. Just a pinch more salt on top of the tomato for flavor. And give that a good mix. Now, this normally is, is an appetizer, correct? Yes, yeah. uh-huh. Or it can be like a condiment if you're eating tacos. You can leave it on the table throughout the meal to put mm. on top of your taco or your steak. It's delicious on a piece of steak or your chicken, whatever you happen to be eating. And how, how many days can you keep uh, guacamole in the fridge? It's best really to make it just a couple hours before you're serving it. Right. Um, you can make it a day ahead, but um, the flavor is really best made fresh. If you wanted to make it for a party, maybe a couple hours earlier, you put it in a bowl and put plastic wrap on it so it's flush with the surface and there's no air getting to the guacamole and that way it won't oxidize and turn brown. Right, so air is your enemy, right? Air There's, is the enemy with yeah. avocados, absolutely. Yeah, probably with most things that you're yeah. preserving. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so now, um, how are you going to serve this? You serve it um, with so chips? Or? This is exactly yeah. how we serve it. It comes to your table like this. We serve it with chips, and we serve it with three salsas. This is a tomatillo salsa, which is very mild. This is a roasted tomato chili de arbol salsa, which is sort of medium. And this is our habanero salsa, which is very spicy. <laughs> we also offer, offer at the restaurant an option of like a crudite of um, sliced uh, vegetables. You were speaking about healthy, so you mm -hmm. don't, if you don't care to have the chips, you can dip jicama and cucumber and radishes in it, and it's quite delicious that way as well, and completely healthy. Now it seems also that chips today come in an assortment of colors yes. and flavors, right? Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what do you suggest? Well, we use traditional corn chips in the restaurant, but blue corn chips are found commonly in Mexico as well. So they use a lot of blue corn as well. Um, but yeah, just the two basic colors are my favorites. And you have a, a brand new cookbook. Yes. Right? And this recipe, I hope, is Absolutely. part of that, Front right? Front and center. 120 different recipes. What are some yeah. of your other uh, uh, recipes? I notice some of them are, um, you know, with here, like this one, made with a warm cactus salad with prickly pear vinaigrette and toasted pumpkin seeds. You turn to this exact page. Yeah. Yep, it's um, it's things that they eat commonly in Mexico that you might not have seen a recipe for mm -hmm. before. But pumpkins grow in Mexico. Oh, that, pumpkin is all over the place, uh -huh. and it's quite common, especially this time of year um, around the Day of the Dead. One of the big desserts is candied pumpkin. And you had quite uh, quite a menu change during uh, the Day of the Dead, right? Yes, uh -huh. we did some really great specials to feature the type of items that would be served mm -hmm. this time of year. The fish in Mexico is, I mean, unquestionably amazing. amazing. Yeah, yes. I mean, because you have, you know, as you say, coastline on, on both sides yeah, of, a of, huge of Mexico and, and, and very clear, clean waters. Yes. And fishing is a big sport in, in Mexico, right? So uh, what typically, what type of fish would you would you use in in some of these recipes? Well, I have a recipe that you're on that page for the sea urchin tostada. Right. Actually, sea urchin's pretty common in the Baja area, which I know you like to visit. And um, there's a woman in Ensenada that makes these wonderful sea urchin tostadas. And most people think of sea urchin with Japanese food, but um, they actually eat it in Mexico. Um, they also do some wonderful smoked tuna there. They farm tuna for Japan, actually, just off the coast of Baja. So there's some great tuna. Uh, shrimp is incredibly popular. Mahi-mahi is very popular because it's, you know, it's bountiful uh, in Mexico.
So a part of what you do is, is you travel around Mexico yes. and go into these small towns and villages looking for unusual, um, um, uh, vet, not only vegetables and fruits, but yeah. uh, recipes. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly what I do. The best thing is to, you know, get in with the local cooks. And if you get to the opportunity to go into someone's home and cook with them, they're often cooking some of the best food. So they really teach you. What was one of the more unusual things that you discovered in, in somebody's home? Um, well, probably insects, I guess. Um, insects are, you know, one of the staples of pre-Columbian Mexico. Um, that's what they survived on before the Spanish came over. And uh, they are still eaten quite commonly in Mexico. So I was introduced to chapulines, which are little crickets in uh, Oaxaca. And they're, they're actually quite delicious on yeah. a tortilla with a, um, a little guacamole. I'm sure the lizards love them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and which of these recipes is your favorite? Oh, that's such a hard question. I'm going to say my favorite is for the tacos al pastor. They are um, a big specialty of Puebla, Mexico, and they, you know, they make them on the big spit, um, like you see gyros made, and it's pork that's marinated in these wonderful seasonings. And the guy, you know, takes a tortilla and he slices some off for you and he flips it up in the air and he catches it in the tortilla <laughs> and gives you a little um, pineapple that's also um, marinated. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's wonderful. So you, that's my favorite today. You get a show as well as the, uh, exactly. as the food. So you can find some of these recipes at uh, Dos Caminos. Yes, and yes, if you many of them. Many of them, and yes. if you want to prepare it yourself, uh, it's a brand new book by yes. Ivy Stark, the executive chef at Dos Caminos. And buy this, I guess, anywhere, right? Yes, anywhere where they, still can, where they still sell books. Where they still sell books. <laughs> um, you can get it on my website, ivystark.com. You can buy it on amazon.com. Or you can buy it on our restaurant website, doscaminos.com, and as well as in all the restaurants. And I know everybody here at the station is going to be very happy that you've been our guest today. We brought extra for you guys. Uh, thank so. you so much. And now thank we're you. going to talk about, hey, and once you eat this, you know, you just can't uh, sit down and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and not work it off. No, so you do have to. Yeah. You have, it's balance in life, right? Yeah, so we're going to tell you how to work this off. We'll be right back. Hard work has built this city. If you've been hurt at work, do you know that you can choose your own doctor? Call me even if you received a PPD rating. I'll protect your workers' compensation rights. Turn to someone you can trust. Enough said. Call Ed. Okay, now let's get serious about working off some of that uh, wonderful Mexican food. With me is um, Lisa Belash. Yes. Why did I say your name right? Belash. Belash. And you know, you hear about different exercise programs all the time. And, but it seems like the rage right now is something called kettlebells. Yes. And, what, what, and, and you are an expert in, in kettlebells. Written, um, you know, you have DVDs yes. on you know, how to do it, and you, you teach it, and you have a, a studio that, that uh, people can work out and do kettlebells. Mm -hmm. what, what exactly is kettlebells? Well, kettlebells have been around for roughly 350 years, and they don't really know how they originated, but they came about in farmer's markets. They were used to actually weigh um, dried goods, so they would use them, and they actually be, uh, they started off in poods, which is what they used in the Soviet Union, so like 16 kilograms, and they still call them kilograms today over in, in, in the Soviet Union. So anyways, um, the ones I brought with me, Today, one of them is a competition style bell and one of them is a regular kettlebell. There are two different styles of kettlebells. There's different methods of training and using them, but when they did come about, they were using them in the markets and finding that they actually had benefits by picking them up and playing with them for entertainment. They were realizing they were getting stronger at their job. They were, you know, be able actually able to perform better. And using the kettlebell actually increased their strength, flexibility, and cardio capacity. So it's got a lot of great health benefits that were accidentally discovered. You know, they, they work kind of like, um, like lifting weights. I yes, mean, right, yes. right, right? I mean, you're lifting a, a weight, and that's the resistance that you're using against your own body. Yes. Um, but what is, would be the difference between a kettlebell and an actual just ordinary weight? Well, the difference is the handle, actually, when you hold it in your hand, the moves that you do with a kettlebell, the kettlebell can actually rotate and go around your hand. So it's resting on the bones and uh, when you're holding the handle, it sits in the hand like so. So when you 
or swinging it or snatching it or pressing it, it's going to rest on the bone structure and your muscles don't fatigue as quickly. Where if you hold a dumbbell and you just press it and you lower it down slowly, your muscles get fatigued a lot quicker. Where with kettlebell training, you actually use your skeleton. So a lot of times the bones themselves are doing the work and they're holding the weight. So therefore you can hold them longer, you can do more repetitions, and there's a lot more benefits for your body. Your nervous system reacts to the handle. So um, if the handle's in your hand, your body now perceives the, uh, that the kettlebell is an extension of your hand. So this isn't where the extremities end, the kettlebell does. So your nervous system responds to this. And, and when it turns over and rolls over in your arm, so if you're doing a snatch or something, which I probably will do a demonstration of, right. when you turn it over, the bell moves over, so that way your body recognizes this as this is part of your body. So it has to react, the fact that your stabilizers actually have to each time that you move it, it's not in a stable you know, position. So it's moving, your body has to control that. So you use all of the stabilizers, including all the major muscle groups as well. Okay, and I'm, the bone structure. I'm curious to see a demonstration of this. <laughs> okay, right, Okay. So. well, there's, there's a few different methods okay. um, that are used. Now, this one is used for competition lifting, as I explained. And that's 25 this pounds. This is 26.4 pound, yeah. pounds or whatever, it's 12 kilograms. And this one is 18 pounds. This bell is made of cast iron and this bell is made of steel. For the competition lifting, the reason you want to use this one is because the majority of the mass is in the ball itself. So you want it to be in this part, not in the handle, where the mm -hmm. cast iron, it's kind of all through the bell. Right. So there's different exercises that you can do. They almost all involve your legs. So everything comes from the lower body, the hips, and with all sports, your hips you know, are basically what is used in every sport, boxing, whatever. You're going to always be using the hips. So you can do things like swinging the bell, and then you can do with one arm. It you looks can, like you need to be careful that you don't you injure do, your back. You do, but when you're taught properly, like well, you don't use your back because you're using your hamstrings and your glutes and your core. And like I said, all of your stabilizers come into play, so your body itself is just working as one mm -hmm. unit instead of you're not isolating any body part. So it's not like I'm gonna just do my biceps, even though you can, that's not really what these are meant for. These are to do the entire body. So like say if I were to do a clean, and then I wanna press it, I could press it with my legs. So now the bell is resting on my wrist bone, and when I bring it down, I want my elbow hitting my hip bone. So I can clean it, and then I can do something also called a jerk, which is bumping it off my body, and then a snatch would be to the top like that. But in each and one you always of these, come down. Yeah. See, these are ballistic movements. So when you aggressively accelerate it overhead, you bring it down like this instead of fatiguing the muscle and slowly bringing it down. So that's the difference. And when you use the competition bell, your hand stays in the same place no matter what the weight. So they come in different weights, but they all look identical. So this is the perfect bell for competition because the mass is all here. You don't want it in the handle. And when you're like doing that. a competition, what are you getting um, measured on? Or you actually on? do, it's endurance, so you do 10 minutes. For the women, it's one kettlebell, five minutes per side, and for the men, it's two. So it's much harder for you know, all of the male lifters. But what you would do is you would have a 10-minute set where you would do as many repetitions as you can in that time frame. And they do have guidelines and they have a ranking system so that you can achieve higher ranks as you compete. So you would go heavier weights, more repetitions as you progress and excel in the sport. And you would do, normally do kettlebells either in a class setting or one-on-one -on -one instruction? I do both. I do both. Um, the majority of my clients now are all in private training, but I do have some group classes where I do kettlebells and I also train Pilates as well. And, and so I do a combination of the two. And, and you feel that doing the kettlebells really, you can get a whole lot more accomplished in a shorter period of time of working out. Yes, it's endurance and it's also, I'm, wait, it's efficient and effective. So it is endurance sport, but the efficiency of it is you burn roughly 11 calories per minute. And when you're using this, you're training everything all at once. You're doing your cardio, your strength training, your abdominals, your, you know, all of that stuff. So you get more done in 20 to 30 minutes than you could if you had to like, you know, lift weights, you know, and then add cardio with it. So you're looking at an hour, an hour and a half versus a half an hour. Mm -hmm. So, and depending of course, how hard that you want to work. So it depends on the person also and the weight that you're using. So that's why it's good to come to a professional so they can assess everything and teach you how to use it 
And I also have a video out, and my second one is just about to be released. So it's instruction and three follow-along workouts. So if you learn it and you feel confident, then you can do it on your own. And you have uh, a website as well where yes, I people do. can get the video and, and yes, instruction. And what is the website? The website is kettlebellbombshell.com. Kettlebellbombshell.com. Yes. Clever name. Now, <laughs> um, I, and we have part of your video that yeah. I think we're going to air as we close the show so people can see. But really quickly, in 20 seconds or less, um, why, what, what interests you about kettlebells? I love started? it because I saved time, I got more done, and I changed my physique, and I built the type of body that I always wanted to have by weight training, and I wasn't able to accomplish exactly what I wanted. So when I added kettlebells, I made my body more to my liking, being leaner, more sculpted, more feminine, but still looking fit and muscular at the same time. Okay, so I mean, you look great, Lisa. So Thank this you. is, you can catch Lisa on her website, get her DVD, and here's, uh, we're gonna show you a little bit of her DVD and, and show you how you can look if you work out with kettlebells. owner of Elite Physique's Kettlebell and Pilates Training Studio. I'm an AKC Rank 1 Kettlebell Lifter, National Level Figure Competitor, and winner of the 2004 Emerald Cup Figure Tall Division. I've tried everything imaginable to get my body into shape. It seemed that I was able to get lean, but staying that way was becoming more of a challenge every year. It wasn't until I picked up a kettlebell that I dramatically transformed my physique and stayed this way with a lot less effort. I actually enjoyed my workouts instead of dreading them and became stronger without getting bigger. If you follow along with my instruction and personalized workout programs that I have created, you will see just as my clients do. Well, it looks great. And where are you located? I'm in central Las Vegas, Sahara and Cimarron. So 2595 South Cimarron, Suite 202. And I'm kind of behind um, Mikhail's restaurant. And it's kettlebellbombshell.com. .com. See you next week. <laughs>